forgiven you for his name's sake. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 38, the Apostle Paul says, Be it known unto you, brethren, that through his name is preached unto you the forgiveness of our sins. Now God is not going to forgive us of sins that we refuse to admit exist. But when we admit our lostness and realize that we're sinners, we're going to long for His forgiveness. And so part of the great news is that by the grace of God, our sins can be forgiven. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins. It's great to be a Christian because my sins have been forgiven me. But second, it's great to be a Christian because my joy does not come from guilty pleasure. You know, that's one of the ironies of those television commercials and those television shows. They are trying to portray sin as living the high life. Test that. You look at those beer commercials and those guys are the ones who are, are really knowing how to live. And those who are pursuing illicit relationships, they're really having fun. And those that have all the material things, they're, they're the ones to be envied. And the really, truly miserable ones that are depicted for us are that man and that woman involved in that monogamous marriage relationship and trying to make it work. But it turns out to be a bitter pill for those who swallow it. How many in trying to live the high life have chosen the road of sin that has made them, at least spiritually, low lives? And yet I can see as a child of God, as a Christian, one of the great things is that my joy does not come from guilty pleasure. We can take great comfort and assurance from passages like we read in 1 Peter where we see, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, knowing this, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, may be found unto praise and honor and glory at His appearing. In whom, having not seen, you love. In whom, though now you see Him not yet rejoicing, or believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. The world by itself cannot understand that. That even with my problems beating down on me and people beating up on me, that I can have great joy, and that because of my Christian life. Now, that doesn't mean that Christianity is a no-tears product, but here's what it does mean. It means that they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Psalm 126 and verse 5. I challenge you to go and read the book of Acts and read it from this perspective. And by the way, the book of Acts is the history book of the church. And a historical perspective that's very important is for us to follow what happens when people become Christians. In the book of Acts chapter 8 and verse 8, we read that the Samaritans became Christians and there was great joy in the whole city. When you become a Christian, you will notice that it should bring joy to other people's lives because you have. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 39, we find that the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing. And then Acts chapter 13 and verse 52, the saints at Iconium were filled not only with the Holy Spirit, but with joy. And then in Acts chapter 15 and verse 3, we read that when those at Jerusalem heard about the others becoming Christians, that it brought them joy. We have joy when other people become Christians and do what we have done to become children of God. So there's that thread of joy in the book of Acts that follows becoming a Christian. And it's not due to lust or greed or money or power. This guilt-free joy that they had and that's possible in Jesus Christ is and comes because we are Christians. But third, it's great to be a Christian because my life has deeper purpose. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, You know all about my purpose. In the book of Romans, Paul tells us that our purpose is what God purposed for us. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Romans 8 and verse 28. And we see that God has purposed for us our purpose through the church from out in eternity before we were. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 through 11. So here's what I find. That my purpose is accomplished by doing what God has purposed for me, and I carry out my purpose by being a member of the church of Jesus Christ. And so to be a Christian is synonymous with being a part of the Lord's church that I read about in the New Testament. Now, I realize that there are things that are my responsibilities on this earth that are a part of my earthly purpose, that I am to work a job, that I am to raise my children in this world, and that I am to uh, prepare for my future on this earth. 
And I'm to enjoy the things that God has provided for us as long as that's kept in proper perspective. And so I'm going to pursue those things, realizing that those purposes are very important. I'm going to meet my obligations. I'm going to be a responsible person on this earth. But the problem comes when any one of these things or a combination of these things becomes more important to me than my central purpose. If I put anything above my responsibility to God, then I am not achieving the purpose that God wants me to achieve on this earth. And so, as Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, and not on things of the earth. And so, as I am earning my living, I am going to keep in mind that I have a bigger job, and that is to lead other people to Christ. And as I'm raising my children to be healthy, adjusted adults in this world, I have a greater uh, purpose in preparing them to live with God in eternity. And as I look ahead at the pleasures and things that I can legitimately fulfill in this life, I also need to look out for the needs of others. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. I want the purpose of the Apostle Paul. Remember what he said in Philippians chapter 1? For to me to live is Christ and die is gain. But if I'm to go on living in the body, that would mean fruitful labor for me. But what shall I choose? I do not know. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. I don't know what happened to the Apostle Paul for sure. History uh, is not clear about that after the book of Philippians. But the best assumption is that he was released from prison and that he continued his ministry for a couple of years more before he was imprisoned again and ultimately loses his head to Nero in the 60s AD. Now here's what I do know. If the Apostle Paul was released from prison, he went out trying to find more preachers to enlist and encourage and more churches to comfort and strengthen and establish. But if the Apostle Paul died as the result of this imprisonment, he went to be with Christ. That's why it's so great to be a Christian because my life has a deeper purpose. I'm working for the Lord here and I'm looking forward to being with Him in eternity. But fourth, it's great to be a Christian because my problems have no permanent hold over me. I already know from the Bible that my life is going to have problems. Job, even though he was suffering severely when he said it was right, when he said, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And so as I look at my life, I realize that I'm going to be struggling. And I realize as I speak to you that there are some of you who are carrying burdens so much larger than I can even imagine. But you know, when you're a Christian, here's the big difference. You don't have a problem that's bigger than the Lord. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed, always caring about in the, Lord, uh, in the body the, the dying of the Lord Jesus so that the death of Jesus may be revealed in us, in our bodies. And so no matter how much you're hurting, you won't feel the pain of it in heaven. No matter how severe it is, you'll bury it in the grave someday. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are made more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. It's great to be a Christian because my problems have no permanent hold over me. And finally, it's great to be a Christian because my future is secure. No offense to the older ones of you who are listening to this, but I'm so thankful that I have more to look forward to than Social Security and Medicare and a 401k. If all I had to look forward to when I woke up in the morning was Growing old and the aches and the pains that go along with it, it would be very hard for me to face another day. You know, sometimes the Bible puts some great contrast together. Two verses side by side that are amazing for the, the difference that is between them. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is one of those examples. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19, Paul says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ Jesus, we are of all men most miserable. Now, imagine for a moment that the Bible stopped right there. That was the last verse in the Bible. If in this life only we have hope in Christ Jesus, we are of all men most...